Millie. That's DB. It's DB. It's Welcome Back to America. I'm here. How you guys doing? Good to see you. Glad you came down tonight. We got a lot of show for you. A lot of show. I did a game show this past week. <clears throat> it's called Six Unseemly Questions, hosted by Victor Vernado. So funny. I've known Victor a very long time. One of the funniest guys around. He writes for The New Yorker. Well, he does cartoons for The New Yorker. And Six Unseemly Questions is a weekly show that he does. Six questions. So funny. Check it out. Twitter. All that stuff. Facebook. YouTube. It's everywhere. And Instagram, too. So check out that game show. Instagram, too. Wow. Yeah. It's all over the place. What do we have going on out there in the news, oh, Millie? Oh, boy. What'd out you find in the, for out us? the U.S. Yeah. yeah. America. Uh, yeah, in America. In Colorado. In Colorado, there was uh, a, a nice rustic lodge. And uh, there was a big black bear that went walking through the hallways uh, because, you know, he was just wandering. It was 2 a.m. in the morning. I guess he just couldn't find a room that was just right. This incident seems borderline racist. Like someone could have accidentally called, like someone on the phone, the front desk, like, there's a black bear in the hallway. It could have easily become like a Karen moment where someone saw a black bear, but it wasn't really, you know, that kind of thing. Right. I think there was, but they took that out of the video. Right. It was, yeah. Yeah. What else is going on out uh, there in the world? Yes. Uh, a Utah man uh, was at a park with a reservoir, and he wanted to take a picture of his nice car with the reservoir behind him, the water behind him. So he pulled it up onto the ramp, and then it rolled into the water. So he actually got pictures of the water behind him, in the back seat, and all around the car. That's hard. Horrifying. That's one of my nightmares is getting the car in the water. I almost fell over a bridge once. You know, in Long Beach, that bridge that takes you over to yeah. Long Beach. Wow. Winter spun out on the bridge once. Wow. Yeah, it's awful. Fun. Scariest thing. Yeah, oh, scariest okay. thing ever. Oh, I'm sorry. So I don't want to end up in water like that ever. Yeah, That's I mean, one of my nightmares. That would be a nightmare. Yeah. Definitely. What else we got going uh -huh. on out there? Uh, okay. So uh, there was a pro professional dog walker that was walking Charlie, her client, when he came running out of the preserves and he had this rubber thing in his mouth. Oh, she was so embarrassed and horrified to see it was a sex toy and uh, she chased him and about 15 minutes trying to get away from him he was doing keep away because he loves that game he's so cute but she couldn't get away from him finally she was able to kick it as it, it bounced into a ditch and then he couldn't get it of course that's the greatest picture ever there's a lot of those pictures on with the internet of dogs, dogs with dildos in their mouths well, that's a thing that, that's a thing. That's a weird yeah. thing. I want no, no part of that. No part of that. I'm not touching it. You want to keep away from me? That's good one. Yeah, Come on, yeah. keep it away. Anyway, so Coca-Cola is pulling tab. <sighs> tab was the pioneer diet soda from back in 1963. It was always bleh. Yeah, it was always well, disgusting. it's not anymore. They need to use the monies for something else. So they're going to be putting out um, a new soda called uh, Topo Chico Hard Celsa <laughs> that is going to be, well, you know, uh, Tab was originally promoted for the beautiful people. So now this Hard Celsa is for the pandemic people, and it's for the good, the bad, and the ugly in quarantine. They need to give them something harder to say. Some real, like, that's difficult to say. Try saying that three times fast. Uh, exactly. I tried. Yeah, yeah. Topo, Chico, Hearts, I, uh, I'm good at it, though. So in addition to our news this week, we got an intern last week. We did? Yeah, we had to take on an intern. Yeah, oh, we yeah, have a yeah, lot yeah, of extra yeah. work around here yeah. that we needed done. Right. So we Russ. took on an intern. That's Russ. We took on Russ, the intern. Yeah. And it was really, so, it was so excited when he came in. We had him hang out at the desk. Yeah. Look at him. He's so happy to be here. It was really so, nice to see. He was so happy at the beginning. So I nice, remember yeah. now. Nice yeah. to see. see oh, him. and then he's touching my pom-poms. Yeah. I don't, I don't like that. Well, they're iconic. The pom-poms yeah. are iconic on the is. show. So he was excited to see him. Yeah. But we had to get down to work. So I showed him a list yes. of what we of all the work we have to do. Of what he had to clean. Yeah. yeah. So you got him. Yes. But, I got him to clean. But you know what? He missed a spot, and I hate that. Yeah, it wasn't shiny enough after it was done. I think he did it like four or five times. Yeah, he's a mess. Then the bathroom's been broken for weeks, so he had to unclog that thing. <laughs> yeah, that was that was. Yeah, that was good. That was good times. He loved yeah, it, though. He, he did. Was really he was good at it. Better him than me. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. Was it like three months that was like that? Yeah, not good. And then he got us those coffees. I don't know how yours was, yeah. but my coffee, the coffee that I got, was a little frothy, and you know how pissed off I get yes, when my co yes, coffee is frothy. Yes, yes. So you know, I you know, I took it upon myself to you know teach him, you know, 
a quick lesson. What did you do? What happened? Well, I, you know, poured a little coffee down his back, maybe. Oh, okay. Well, that probably got him Yeah, it got moving. his attention for sure. And he got moving. Did he yeah. go get you more coffee? He didn't even know what happened because I ran. So by <laughs> the time he turned around, <laughs> yeah. And then because he wouldn't shut up about it, you put him in the car. Yes. Yeah, we had to get him locked. He was annoying. But he couldn't breathe, so you left, let it open. And then he almost got out. I was feeling in a good mood, that's why, so. Yeah, and then yeah. he almost got out, though. We don't want well, Rots to get away. No, that's why I had to put him in the back. Yeah, but he loved it. He's never. He's like, I've never been in a trunk before. Yeah, he he was so excited. Pick him up and put, I'm like, what? I'm yeah, like a little baby. Up. He wanted to be like. Like a big, big baby. Yeah, but he was excited to get in there. Yeah, yeah, he was excited, but you know, he, he, you know, he thought it was a big joke, but you know what? It's not a joke. Wear no. your mask properly. No, that made you mad, but yeah. he's, you know, he, he tied himself up and you shut him I up quick wa though. Uh, I wanted that him to, that's right. Work on America. The America's awesome. That's yeah. right. And be quiet. He's so happy doing. about it though, but there he is. You know, <laughs> Ross is our intern. He's, he's been here for he a week. A, he's, he, he was a dog. We'll never forget that guy. We'll never, never forget him. It's great to have forget. him around There he is looking at yeah. by the taillight. How and then cute. it pulled off. The car pulled off, and I haven't seen him in a while. Oh, I don't know boy. where he's been. Yeah. But we uh, have um, uh, our show today. We have our guest, Richie Minervini. Uh, he's an icon of comedy, East Side Comedy Club, you know, on the shirt over here. He's going to be, uh, we have a few uh, segments oh. with him. And we talked to him for a little while. He's really great. I don't. Mm. Hey, guys. Oh. Hi, um, Rusty. Hey. Hi. I'm sorry, Back who are you? Off, buddy. Uh, Back off. Ross. The Ross? Yeah. You just watched photos. Oh! <laughs> Oh, the pictures! You're the guy in the pictures. I like your makeup. He's the guy in the pictures. Okay, yeah. What's up? Can we, can we help you? Is there something you need? Well, I just. Wait, where, wait, 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 where did you just come from? You. I woke up in a field. It's it was fine. I mean, there was just a few wild animals, but I made it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're here. That's great. I'm really sorry. That's weird that that would happen. I would never do that to anyone. Yeah, never. I. What do you have there? You. I wanted you guys to sign my college credit form. Oh, we. We don't do college credit around here. Ever since the pandemic, we're not allowed to do any what college happened? credit. Oh, oh, that was uh, wow. Yeah, it's a little raw. Your eye, all messed up. Uh, I don't. I don't even know what that's from. I just okay. kind of woke up. The pain was just sort of there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we don't do college credit, and I'm really sorry about this, but you're fired. We have to get rid of our interns. We're not going to be able to afford you. But as a consolation. You can take the garbage out on the way out. Oh, that would be great. That's oh. so nice. Yeah, yeah. I do love garbage. Yeah, no, you oh, yes. it. it was on your resume. Yeah. So, yeah, so if you okay. could just hop into that. I'm All sort right. of minoring in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. okay. All right, bye, Ryan. Yeah. Right. So, hey, yeah. oh, yeah. thank you, bye. thank you. And Thanks, if you could guys. leave a 20 for the pizza later, oh, that would oh, be great. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thanks, hey, Russ. Hey, can you get me a calzone, too, please? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Rusty. We'll reimburse you. So, yeah, we got uh, Richie Minervini's on, Minervini. icon of comedy, Eastside Comedy Club. This man found people like Eddie Murphy and Rosie O'Donnell and Kevin James and got them on the stage for the first time. Very important person in comedy, so stay for those interviews. Of course, Millie Michaels, as always, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, Dan. Stay tuned. What a nice man. Welcome back to America. D.B. Frick, Millie Michaels. Millie Michaels. See ya. Bye, Rusty. Who? Ross, Ross, mm, I don't know, know. okay. Everybody, I am DB Frick. This is Welcome Back to America. I have someone today who uh, is very special. Firstly, special Millie Michaels is with me. She came on to uh, help me with this awesome Ooh. interview that uh, she uh, helped me get. I have a, uh, a an icon of comedy, someone who's been around for a really long time, came up during the most important time in comedy, during the 70s and 80s, when all the really important stuff in comedy was happening, all the sitcoms were happening, all the most famous people in the world right now 
came out of this circle that this man is part of and that he's had so much to do with. And he had a comedy club that had so much to do with so many people coming up, so many important names. Ladies and gentlemen, Richie Minervini, thank you for coming down to our show. This is awesome to have you. Um, I feel uh, 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 I, I'm so humbled with the fact that you're here. This is a really big deal. So, so thanks a lot. I want to sort of get right into it with you. When was the first time that you got on stage? Well, that's a good question. Um, it kind of started, um, started probably in 1976 uh, or seven. There was a show on TV called The Gong Show. Uh, had Chuck Barris and uh, had all these crazy acts on. And then bars, like they do, like now today, I guess bars are doing uh, America's Got Talent Thursday night at uh, this bar and that bar. They had the gong show at this bar and that bar. And um, it looked like a lot of fun. Uh, I was in a band. I couldn't play the bass very well. I couldn't sing. But when the guys broke a string, I would be, they go, say something. And I would <laughs> them busy that way. Uh, so you sort so, of became the MC. You sort of became the host. Uh, yeah, like I, and I could talk for about six minutes enough to tune up a guitar and, you know, say, nice to be here. You know, just see whatever I see, like, uh, like, why is that flag upside down? Questions like that. Anyway, why is that flag upside down? <laughs> oh, because America's in trouble. I feel, I feel that, yeah, I feel it's in trouble. We've always survived. And we always we've, do. Yeah, no, there's always maybe trouble. Next year, maybe after the election, we'll write that flag. Yeah. <laughs> I think no, no matter what, there will always be some sort of distress that's going on in any, in any nation. They would have never to going to go away now. We have opened up a really big hole that people now get to complain about everything, whatever bothers them. You can't like 90% of something anymore. What do you do? They, they complain about the 5%, the 10% they don't like. Right. You know, and, and, they, and they want something for it. It could, yeah. could be the greatest meal in the world. You go to a restaurant, you enjoyed your steak, you enjoyed your vegetables. Uh, the bread was a little dry. Do they talk about anything else? The bread. Right. Yeah, they, 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 the bread was better last time. I need. I need money. I need. I'm never coming here again. Give me some money back. Give me. Give me a free ticket. Uh, America's turned turn to a bunch of whiners. Yeah. Where the uh, the place of comedy and where comedy has gone is definitely a part of the conversation that I'd like to go today. I want place to go. Yeah. No, I definitely want to hear. Some of you. our greatest comics are not taking jobs at uh, colleges. Uh, and I'm talking about guys like Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock because they've gotten too politically crazy, uh, racist. Uh, they, uh, in Ohio, Jerry did a college. I think he's making $750,000. And the guy gave, wrote him up, some guy from the Midwest. He said he was an anti-Semite and a racist. Wow. And he said, so Jerry called him up and said, what, what do you mean? He said, you made fun of Jewish people. He goes, I am Jewish. Right. He goes, well, how was I supposed to know your name's not Goldberg or Schwartz or something? Right. And, no, and it's so like, that's anti-Semitic. Well, you right, mean? not knowing that. Right. I've had, I've had enough. I mean, he's, so he's had enough. He's just, you know. Terrible. Well, now, you're part of one of the most important um, legendary pieces of comedy on Long Island. You put together one comedy club in the 80s, late 70s, called East Side Comedy. November 1979. 1979. I was two years old. That's an amazing... I, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. You had, really you had really good ID. Wow. I'm 100% sure my family went to your shows. I know that people from my family, because everybody on Long Island, that if you were going to see comedy on Long Island, you were going to see it at East yeah. Side. That's my yeah. understanding. Mm -hmm. And Millie, you worked there. You worked. I worked at the second location in Farmingdale. So, so back the, in the nineties, in the early nineties, I started. Early nineties, wow! Yes, right. it was a wonderful experience. Oh, wonderful. it was so fun! And Millie, as always and since, has fit right in. And we had a tough bunch of girls that were like there for like fifteen years, no. and, and and they didn't let a lot of people in, but Millie fought away in, humiliated people. We had people like Charlene. She came right back. She got it, dished it out better. They laughed. They were instant friends. Yeah. We loved it. Millie is a badass. Millie oh, yeah. Badass. I'm a badass. Yeah. Um, this show wouldn't be as good as it is if it wasn't for Millie being part of it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm really <laughs> lucky that she does it. Uh, 
wanted to know here, I do some sort of questions that are a little off, but let's say that you were on the run with a lot of money. Where would you hide? Wow. Well, you know, I've been working on cruise lines since 1983. So I literally have been around the world. The greatest cruise I ever was on was actually my last cruise, which was uh, Antarctica. Beautiful. Really? Yeah. Started off in uh, Buenos Aires and then for four days. And I was with the naturalist on board. I know this guy for five years. He's gone to Hawaii. He's, he's tagged uh, sea lions and, and sharks. And this guy said, you know, it's either going to be a really bad cruise or, or a great cruise. Said, what do you mean? He said, we could get fogged the entire time yeah, and we'll bad. see nothing. I said, wow. He said, however, I've been here a couple times. It's uh, clear, and then it's like going down, if you like Alaska, he said, this is like going down Broadway in New York, and every, it's a 2,000 foot uh, glacier, then a 7,000 foot glacier, then a 10,000 foot glacier, and he said, and you can see it clearly, and that's what we had for five days. That's lucky. Just, yeah, yeah, I mean, they got really strict, no, no straws on the deck, no paper napkins on the deck, it is so pristine. And, and so preserved and so natural. And so it's absolutely amazing. And only one time in my life did I hear a captain say, if you look off the starboard side, you'll see five walker whales eating a shark. And, and you got these you know, binoculars, you look over there, oh, it looks like there's six walker whales. And there's blood and guts. And I had these great binoculars. I was like, oh my <laughs> God. That's it's awesome. Like and you know, I, I said the dumbest thing in the world. This is like watching TV. And the natural said, where do you think they filmed the TV shows? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. <clears throat> now, you, tell, you bring up cruises, and uh, that's an important piece of what, you know, travel and that industry and everything about people going away. And how or what have you heard about cruises coming back? And what are they doing? Have you heard anything about what they're doing in entertainment wise? Absolutely, I've heard lies, nothing but lies. Lies. I, I, got, I got off a ship March 3rd and nobody knows. They said, listen, we're gonna give us uh, 30 days, we're right back out again. And then I got the phone call. It looks like we're gonna go end of May and then May went to June and June went to July. July, they told us uh, August, September. So I've been calling up the cruise lines like a passenger and trying right. to book the earliest cruise possible. So um, I finally, they said, well, no guarantee, but you can use this money towards your next cruise. I went, listen, I'm taking my family away. We're either gonna rent an RV and go across the country, but it's gonna be the week of, and I started like in August, September. I finally got a cruise book, November 27th. I was like, yay. Wow. Hello, it's Thanksgiving. Isn't that Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they moved it, they moved it, yeah. The cruise lines have all been very independent, and now there's a cruise line consortium, and they're getting together, and they decided that they're not sending a ship out until January. Wow. wow. Disney announced December 20, uh, January 2, uh, 2021, about five months ago, six months ago. They were the first ones to say, we're not doing it until. Now, um, I, we uh, have a few commercials that we have to get to, but I want to come back with you, Richie, and ask you a few more questions about comedy. So, okay, and I want to ask you about Mae West. Awesome. So we'll be right her. back. We'll be right back with Welcome Back to America right after these messages. Uh, I actually just came from a Holland America European cruise. So, and let's do that again for another ship. Just came from a Norwegian cruise line European cruise on Celebrity and RCL. Okay. I'm gonna send this tape out to all of them. I want to get hired. <laughs> but these uh, these world crews, I'll tell you what. It's looking at you folks. It's good to see all you young people. <laughs> <laughs> they had a late show at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> they still fell asleep. <laughs> Old people. My it was my first deaf comedy jam. <laughs> On the holidays, I did Toys for Tots, 500 Harley Davidson guys, 500 bikers come out. I figured this has got to be a tough crowd. No, no, the world crew is much tougher. They come in like a gang, 200 strong on their rascals and hover rounds. <laughs> you 
better be funny, idiot. <laughs> Tough crowds. How many people in the front row looking like this? <laughs> oh, you think you're doing good there, like, uh, uh, uh. The guy next to him is wheeled on his hose. Uh, uh, uh. And I hope to be one of those people one day, I do. I joke about it, but it's serious. I mean, you know, they come in late, they come in late, like... <laughs> and with all the miracles of modern medicine, when are they gonna develop a walker that doesn't have the four tennis balls right there on the bottom? When? <laughs> Is this for active seniors? <laughs> I got a big game with Venus and Serena coming up, okay. Tennis balls right about then they had the John McEnroe run filled with crystal meth. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs>
and I went to my father's place. Uh, Jackie's band was playing. I didn't know who Jackie was. He was called Off Our Rockers. And Jackie would be uh, singing some original song, great songwriter, romantic songwriter. And then he would start doing these goofy jokes and things. He literally had a guitar and he had a tambourine on his foot and he had a bass drum on the other foot and he would clap things together. And he had a great, and he had a guy named Chris Bates who had a great voice on a guitar and a, a guy named Herbie. And I remember his name because he would, he played the organ. He'd go, sell him a few clams, Herbie. And Herbie would do these big organ, uh, and after the show, but he would tell a bunch of jokes. I go, hey, listen, man, you're a funny guy. You need to come down to Dixon's and, and uh, try. No, I don't do, I don't do, I don't do comedy. He said, you did nothing but comedy. <laughs> no, I'm a singer. I go, a singer? You told 102 jokes up there. And uh, he said, <laughs> oh, no. It's funny. Jackie was actually yeah, talking. Back. That's yeah, fine. Jackie, Jackie was he, just talking. Jackie talked about the same thing that you're talking about right now, how I'm not really a comedian. He's like, I'm not a comedian. I'm really a musician. Yeah. So he said to me, hey, uh, how do you become a comedian? I reached into my pocket. I pulled out a card. He said, Betty Boop production. I had a picture of Betty Boop and uh, holding my card on the card. Okay. I said, Listen, I printed up this card and said comedian and people take my word for it. <laughs> and he thought that was very funny. And we met and, uh, Jackie and I instrumentally, he was instrumental in putting all these comedy shows together at these bars. He had a PA system, he had speakers, he had lights. Yeah. And, uh, and me and him, Jackie, started the comedy. He loved being a musician and he didn't want to get into the club business. He, he just said he didn't want to be locked into one place. So he said no. What is your part in the documentary? Uh, were you just, okay, were you... Jackie's been on the radio for about 100 years. Yes. So he tells me they're doing a documentary with his pal Ian Carr. And I go, okay, I'm driving in from upstate somewhere, a gig, to get to Jackie's house. And I'm, I'm speeding. I want Jackie is so on time, so, so a perfectionist, and I am not. But I'm driving like a lunatic. I get there. I'm in a raggy T-shirt. I'm in a pair of shorts. I get there. Ian's there. They got a studio set up with cameras, three cameras shoot. I go... What's going on? He goes, the documentary. I said, like on the radio, you and Ian. You, you and Ian had a radio show. No, it's so like, so we're going to shoot this. I went, oh my God. I said, listen, give, give me 20 minutes. I go into his house. That guy had my luggage. I, I take a quick shower, blow out the hair, a shave, and I put on this crazy nightclub jacket with paisleys on it. And I sat down and uh, we, had a nice, we had a nice interview. It was fun. I mean, and it's a nice jacket because I've seen it. <laughs> it's a lame and fine jacket. That's the problem with those jackets. You can only wear them four times. If you wear them to one big gig, you got to throw them out. And, you know. <laughs> do you remember what I have that jacket? Do you remember what led you to opening East Side? Yes. What made you want to open a comedy club? Yes, I actually I was a, I was a gold jacket wearing Century Twenty One realtor. Okay, we had, uh, we, we had the million dollar sellers. I'll tell you that's one house on Long Island, but back in the day, it was probably like 15 <laughs> homes. You made a million dollars, ooh, a million dollar seller. And went yeah. to Lenny's and Great Neck, and the, I'm 480 people in gold jackets, and there's a guy on stage called Sal Richards. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I mean, I, as much as I liked comedy, I didn't know how to get there. I saw guys like Bob Hope and Johnny Carson, even the Don Rickles, Jackie Green, uh, Bob Newhart, but I'm just a guy with a gold jacket, and I see this guy, Sal Richards, who is performing in front of 450 people, as funny as anybody I've ever seen, totally unknown to me. And it turned out he was a Casco comic, lived on Long Island. I talked to him after the show, and he said, look, if you want to do this, uh, come on up to the Catskills with me. So he lived out in Smith, uh, Smithtown. I lived in Huntington. I called him up. He said, listen, why don't we meet at the Dunkin' Donuts right by 110? I will get right off. I'll park my car, and I'll go with you. He goes, hey. You want to go with me? You come to my house, and then, uh, or don't go. I gave you the address the other day. I said, well, wouldn't it be more convenient? Click. He hangs up the phone. <laughs> hello, hello. So I drive out there. I don't want to be late. I'm there uh, 45 minutes early. Uh, some lady, a beautiful lady, comes out and happens to be his wife. Can I help you? I said, I'm looking for Sal Richard. Oh, yeah, this is his home. I'm his wife. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to meet him at the... Uh, Three o'clock. She said, "Well, it's only two fifteen. Oh, I didn't want to be late." And she goes, "Okay. Well, let me let me see. Maybe you can come in." So that'd be nice. I opened my door. She goes, 
well, wait a minute, let's stay there for a second. She comes back with a glass of water with ice in it. <laughs> Sal said he'll be out in 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I wait in my car. Uh, we drive up there. He, he's driving his nice little Eldorado. And uh, he stops at the, for coffee. I said, he goes, oh, I'm a little tired. Let me get some coffee. He goes, I think it's only, uh, like, you know, we got a map. Bill of Rome. I said, I think it's only like 15 minutes. I know where it is. I want some coffee. He gets on the phone. And now we're driving. And, he, oh, I, I want the manager there. I want the owner there. I want the guy there to pick up my bags. Uh, meet me in the backstage door. Backstage door. You got me? All right. Man. So he's a big shop. Thinking, wow. So we see a big sign, Villa Roma. Like, oh, we're here. Then we see another big sign, billboard. Sal Richards. I went, oh, my God. His name is on a sign. It says, Villa Roma, one mile. He goes, hey, I'm a little tired. You want to drive? I go, a mile? It's a mile and a half. You want to drive? <laughs> So I, I, all right, I, guys, I don't want to rock. I, I drive, I get behind the car. I'm, do, I'm doing pretty good as a realtor. I get behind the car, we come around the back. You go, there's five people out there, guys in suits, a guy, a bad guy, uh, stage production, sound man. I go, Sal, opening season. Oh, it's great to have you open up the season this year. This is going to be great. Uh, this is Richie, my driver. Uh, Richie, get my, <laughs> Richie, get my bag in the trunk. I went, Richie, what? The bag, the bag, the bag. I went, oh, oh yeah, okay. So I, uh, and I did that all summer. I watched Sal Richards perform. I drove him, and I drove great. the last two miles. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's funny. We're talking about Long Island comedy so much. What is it you think that is in the water at Lo in Long Island comedy? People are funny all over the country and all over the that world. That is a great question, and and I know the answer. I would love to hear it. Okay. There's comedy from coast to coast, without a doubt. Started in New York, uh, Catch Rain Star, Danger Fields, Improv, and then you had the LA ones going, uh, the Comedy Store, the Ice House, uh, the Improv. Okay, so now the comics in the city are really cool comics. They can talk about uh, uh, their potholes and their elevators and their escalators and the bums and everything else. And when they're in the city, they're great. But when you go to the Midwest, People don't know from buses, from trains, from uh, urinating in the streets, from homelessness. And that's their point of view. We on Long Island are 45 minutes away from New York City. We have a glimpse of that, but we're really suburbia. And most of the country is suburbia. They can relate to next door neighbor business that we talk about and uh, <laughs> families being close. And, and I think the Long Island guys just had an advantage. I mean, Seinfeld, I mean, uh, Jack Roy, who was Rodney Dangerfield, Alan King was up from Long Island. I'm going to say Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Yeah, all Baldwin brothers, yeah. And, uh, and uh, Jackie Mason. Uh, and Eddie Murphy uh, and Howard and Stern. And then, then later, that was the first wave. And then the next wave came. It was uh, Eddie Murphy was the first to bust. Jackie, I should know, Bobby Nelson was the next. And Jackie Martley. Rob Bartlett is still going real strong. Um, John Farantino, a comic magician, did 80 seven TV shows and 35 in two years is managed by Ray, uh, Ray Romano's manager, Rory Rosegarden. And, you know, it was new. And Rory will tell you, he overexposed his act in two years. John was on everything. And right. when he went to a club, they went, we've seen this guy. I mean, he's, he had two hours of material. We've seen him. So he had to lay low for a while to get going. Oh is there anyone coming up that you like now? Is there anyone out there that you've watched? youngsters maybe not maybe. so young i swear i swear i swear and jackie and i talk about this all the time we used to know every comic in the country it was 400 of us you know there was 100 of us when we started then it was there's ten thousand. every time i meet somebody they're a comedian and right. they also had this little you know business where they sell umbrellas or something and that kind of leads me that leads me to my next question. Where do you see comedy going now? I mean, it's shut down. There's a lot of things you can't do. Some TV's being done now. People can't get on stage everywhere. It's hard to get booked. Cruises. It, it's almost reverted back to when we started. I mean, um, there were no comedy clubs. I was working, I would go to bars and say, give me their worst night. So we worked Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Then we worked firehouses. Uh, we used to go up in rock and roll joints and say, hey, can we go on stage when the band takes a break? Uh, they're going to hate you. You know, we didn't, we didn't know from that. Okay, I mean, beer bottles being thrown. You suck it off the stage, you know, all that other nonsense. 
there seems to be um, a bunch of guys. I hear them working in backyards now, and they're working at all these. They cut the comedy clubs down, but comics are very uh, innovative. So they're finding other ways to do stuff. You can't go to a comedy club, but you can't go to a, a banquet hall or a, a bagel store, a pizza store. They're working in these back rooms. It's kind of like underground. <laughs> You were producing a few shows under East Side in the months preceding the pandemic, correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I and literally you... was back in the building of East Side. It was called um, Pomodorino. Pomodoro. Pomodorinos, yes. I was actually going to come to that show. I was there. You were there, Millie. So was... Manny, Manny Arias was a great young man. Love him. He, called, he goes in there to try to book a show there. Or he gets called from the guy. I understand you do comedy shows. So he goes down there and the guy, Manny goes, this is the East Side Comedy Club. He goes, yeah. And the guy goes, and the guy, Phil Adamo, the owner said, yeah, Richie Minervini started comedy right here. It's a legendary spot. He was a great guy. And I, yeah, he's gone now. And Manny goes, he's gone now? What do you mean he's gone now? Well, he's not around anymore. He's dead. Uh, and Manny goes, he's not dead. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I haven't heard from him like years. <laughs> Manny calls me up. He goes, hey, Richie, there's a guy here who thinks you're dead. I go, where are you? He goes, I'm at the old east side. I go, well, what do you mean dead? He goes, just a random phone call. This guy, I'm so sorry. I haven't, I said, well, that's what you want to hear 40 years into your career. He right. died eight years ago. Uh, so I went and met him. We started a show there. We were going to really continue and, and turn it into the old east side again. He was going to shut down and rebuild. And pandemic hit. Oh boy, yeah. that's bad. Well, maybe you know what? my my old partner Steve Cotterelli came in, and he was going to be involved with us. And then Billy Dean and we had we had Billy Dean's burlesque every Tuesday night for as long as we had the club. We had Billy Dean's burlesque, and I used to say these guys, these male strippers, they should be mailmen because rain, sleet, or snow, these sold out. Comedy shows are arranged in the snow, a half a crowd left. But these girls showed up for his show. Wow. It was incredible. He's still going strong. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, Richie, you were in, uh, you competed in Star Search against Eugene O'Donnell, right? The, that was uh, one of the highlights of my career. Um, some great comedians I knew, like uh, Dennis Wolfberg and Joe Bolster. These guys were already established headliners. I was not. They had trouble on those shows. I said, what happened? He said, you give you two minutes. There's cameras going. They tell you there's 20 million people out there. And you just, I just tightened up. I couldn't think of my next joke. And I'm there looking out at the audience. I'm only seeing 450 people. I don't know about these 20. And they tell you backstage, 20 million people across America will be watching. And I just saw 400 people. And they had a, they had a audio glitch. And I was like, you got to be kidding. I got wow. two out here. I said, I, I said, ladies and gentlemen, they said, all right, we're going to have to stop. We're going to start over again. I go, start over again. This is my shot. I said, I played every dive comedy club from coast to coast to get to L.A. It's just a bigger hole. Not so, <laughs> oh, man. And then Rosie tells me that she's going to win. I go, Rosie, how are you going to win? Ed McMahon told me I was going to win. Don't worry about it. I said, all right. And uh, so she was supposed to go up against Steve Middleman who won the New York laugh off. He beat Carol Leifer, Eddie Murphy, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, and Paul Reiser. Wow, so, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, Millman was great. He was number one. Eddie came in number five, had a really bad show. They picked Eddie. You know, the powers that be went young, good looking, clean. This guy's a star. He, he wasn't polished. He didn't have any material, but they picked Eddie first. The others all actually uh, made it. Yeah, uh, subsequently over the years. Writing a book is the adventure of a lifetime. Red Penguin Books take pride in giving our authors a publishing experience that is stress-free and celebratory all the way. Some of our authors first approach us with no more than an idea for a book that's ready to sprout. Others submit completed manuscripts. Whether you're at either end or anywhere in between, our goal is to get you published. At Red Penguin Books, we offer options and opportunities that are unique in the world of publishing, and all of them are designed to keep you, the author we so deeply respect, in the driver's seat, unlike other publishing houses. So, if you want to write a book and are looking for a publisher, 
we've got you covered. Red Penguin Books deal in publishing services, book development, and ghostwriting for digital, print, and audiobook. Call us at 516-448-4993 or visit our website www.redpenguinbooks.com. Now you bring up you bring, you you bring up Eddie. We were talking about Eddie Murphy, obviously. I wanted to know if you remember when you first met him, and if you remember when you first saw him on stage. And yes, do you remember that experience at all? 1977 at uh, Rich M. Dixon's White House Inn. He would come in, and I uh, was a young kid. He went on stage the first week. I was a student of comedy. I, I studied everybody. And he crushed it. And everyone's saying, oh, God, great, great, great. I said, hey, kid, I was the MC. I said, you're doing Richard Pryor. Yeah. And he went, are you, what do you know about Richard Pryor? I mean, it was really that segregated back then. You didn't watch, you know, across the board. Richard Pryor was an underground comedian that they knew in his community, but he wasn't on TV. And I go, just do your own stuff. So the next week he comes in. And uh, he cleaned it all up. He did Bill Cosby. I said, all right. <laughs> he, he was like, I think he was 16 years old. Wow. Uh, and then we, we got friendly and we went out on the road and Eddie would fall asleep when it said toll booth, one mile. Everybody used to chip in and <sighs> he'd be sleeping. There's something and, about and you Eddie, being a mile away from places. There's something yeah, about- Yeah, he toll booth, one mile, he'd go to sleep. Uh, he's also, I think he was a high school senior. So we were all 25, 26. Wow. And we'd be out, we'd do a comedy show, we'd be at a bar, and he's like, hey, guys, I, I gotta go to school tomorrow. Or go sleep in the car, he'd bring his pillow, he'd be in the back seat. We'd get out at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, Jackie, me, Dave Hawthorne, Bobby Woods, and we'd drop this poor boy off at like four or five in the morning, and he had to go to school in three hours. Wow, well, okay, that's so... <laughs> that's so that's he amazing. gets to Saturday Night Live, yeah, there was a guy by the name of um, Franklin Ajaya. Oh, I know, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Franklin well, Jack. He had a little bit of trouble on Saturday Night Live. They wanted him. He was set to go, but uh, he didn't show up for rehearsals and things. I mean, his, his is his big break. He's already celebrating. He signed the contract. He, he can't wake up in the morning, okay? He's a nightclub comic. And he thought he suggested that they shoot at night because they were a nightclub comedian. Right, yeah. That's, that's, what, that's why he'd be awake. You know, he wakes up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we can do the show at night. So he got, they got rid of him. Then they had another guy named Charlie Barnett, very funny man, yep. brilliant mind. Mm -hmm. he mimicked uh, a couple of the bits that they did before. They gave him a script and managed to let's take it home. And Charlie came in the next very next day and nailed it. And Lorne Michaels saw something a little askew. They gave him another bit and managed to give me an hour. They went back to the room. Charlie comes in, nails it. Five other people in the bit. He knew when he had to come in and come out. And then and then Lorne handed him something. He said, "Just read this to the camera, will you?" And Charlie went, doesn't read. No oh boy. Wow, doesn't that's read. That's now, hard. they need to fill that slot next week. They get an Eddie Murphy out of nowhere, nice, uh, clean cut uh, uh, reading. And he had garbage parts for the first five or six episodes. And then all of a sudden, he had really stupid parts. Back that truck up. You know, all the stupidest stuff in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy with a broom. Uh, just a, he was a... Uh, an extra at best. It's important to note that when Eddie Murphy auditioned for SNL, he went in there wearing your jacket, an East Side comedy <laughs> jacket. It's that important to note that. It's a big <laughs> deal. Yeah, it was kind of fun. And I have this fantasy. I have this fantasy that I've had for months since he was coming back to doing stand-up, which maybe has changed now. Maybe he won't at all. But I sort of imagined him coming back to Long Island to his roots to try to like, you know, you know, this just seems to make sense. Go back home, visit your past, yes. and he would do a show for East Side. Well, I just here's, feel that. Here's a, here's, a great, here's a great story. So anyway, on Saturday Night Live, they were running short on time. The skit that they were going to do sucked. And he goes, I got Mr. Robinson's neighborhood. They go, what's that? A bit uh. they perfected. And he, and he went, oh, all right, all right, do it. So no one saw him do it before. He went up, crushed. After that, a rewritten contract, and he's the star of the show. Wow. One episode, they needed four minutes to be filled. He had, came out with his outfit, and, and he crushed it. So Eddie was going to go back to stand up recently. It's like a year and a half, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And this guys in the city used to give us a bit of a hard time being Long Island guys. Um, I was... 
they, they were all they were all this and they, they worked and, and and they were funny they worked the comedy clubs they got five dollars a hamburger and a beer and i was a, a businessman kind of so i was doing these nightclubs where the comics were getting 50 75 dollars 100 dollars and there was a little resentment well uh eddie eddie went into uh the comic strip there was a guy named df swedler there and uh, he was he used to harass Eddie all the time. He's too young. When Eddie made it, he said he hasn't put his time in. He doesn't deserve it. He hasn't been on the stage for nine months, a year. And I said, DF, you've been here for seven years. You tell me if somebody offered you a million dollars, you would say, no, I'm not ready. So DF for harassing Eddie was never nice to Eddie. Well, two or three years ago, Tinkin, Richie Tinkin calls me up, the owner of the, the comics, and said, hey, you want to come to the city? I go, yeah, what's up? Eddie wants to do a spot at the comic strip under the radar on a Tuesday. I said, okay, cool. Eddie, Eddie said, you know, it'd be great to have Richie there. I go, all right. So we drive in, really rainy night, and we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Eddie shows up. He comes in. The hellos are big. There's like 30 people in the room. And uh, he goes in the room, and, he, and he's like, you know, he's getting ready. Who's on stage emceeing? D.F. Swedler. From 35 years ago, Eddie laughed so hard. He goes, Tinkin, I can't do this. I'm just going to go make fun of that guy. I got to get out of here. <laughs> and he left. That's he just amazing. Left. That's hilarious. That's a I laugh hope story for everybody but D.F. Sweetler. <laughs> yeah. Who I think was also worked on SNL. I don't know why. His name seems, seems like he was there. I don't a, know why. He was a brilliant, brilliant writer. Excellent yeah. writer. You know what was really fun at the East Side, Richie and Farmingdale? was when we did stand-up spotlight for the whole oh week my God. hosted by Rosie O'Donnell. Well, you know, everybody thought Rosie and I were mad at each other for some reason. Um, when we were on Star Search, the singer stepped across his other room. The, the models were like in different spots and there was this competition thing. But I'm sitting with Rosie, we're writing jokes for three days and they go, uh, where's the challenger, Richie Minervini over here? And we're, and we're, what do you guys do? I go, there was no animosity. It was like, you know, it was going to be what it was going to be. I stayed there, and she asked me to stay a couple extra days, so write some more materials for her to go up against Steve Middleman. So um, people thought, I can't believe Rosie won. She didn't deserve it. I said, listen, Ed McMahon liked her, and obviously it turned out very well for Ed McMahon picking her. I have a comedy club. There are great comics. I just don't personally care for her. I don't put on my stage. Ed McMahon didn't personally care for me. He liked her way before. And that's the way, it's just the way it works. I went out, I had a great show. I didn't get nervous. I didn't, I didn't stumble. And I was like, okay, I can, I can do this thing. So a couple of years go by, Rosie wants to pay me back somehow. I go, you don't have to pay me back. She goes, well, suppose I shoot my TV show in your club. I went, oh, I would love that. Yeah. I said, what would that cost? She goes, we'll give you money. I went, really? I mean, I don't know anything about show business. I, I am a, a nightclub guy. She came in, she sent a group in before. I thought I had some pretty good equipment. They took down my lights, put up other lights. They didn't like my power unit. They put a better board up and they put really great speakers. And um, they were taking down the lights and leaving. And Rosie said, do we have to leave, take the speakers and the power unit? And I said, no, we don't have to, leave it. So she left me with about $85,000 worth of uh, sound system. And wow. she shot for two weeks. Millie, am I right? It was only women? It was two weeks of women? No, no. We had Ray Romano was there. We had a second week. All right. One week was all women. Then, But Rosie, I mean, was a big star. She was the funniest one. She was and they just, had, they just had wrapped on a, a league of our own. So that whole cast and crew was there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So And Rosie, they're, they're, they're running a little short on time. So remember Rosie... What, she was doing a bunch of different shows. So rather than go to the dressing room, Rosie was so funny. She had two guys come out with a blanket and she would dress behind the blanket for the next yeah. show. Yeah. And she, oh, it was hysterical. Hysterical. Was it was great. a great, great, great time. It was, uh, and, and I'll tell you what, DB, the letdown when she left, it was two weeks of show business and lights and cameras and interviews and, and, uh, and, and big people. And then all of a sudden it was like, uh, next week, the best of Long Island comedy. Mm -hmm. It was like it was like the New Year's Day. You had such a, like oh New Year's Eve was so great. The next day is like oh god, we got to wait three hundred sixty four more days for that. And I think the great uh, Broadway director Hal Prince said the best thing to have once a job has ended is another job. 
Oh, so yeah. You, yeah. you go right into something else. But, yeah, but I can understand that being jaded by Hollywood and shiny things. Oh, yeah, I, you're there. And then tomorrow it's not there. Yeah. Right. And that's what like everybody, I think even the most famous people in the world feel like that. I'm sure Eddie Murphy's felt like that in moments where oh, yeah, I think, I think uh, you want to get that, that, that kick back again. And uh, I took Eddie to, uh, to see his own movie 48 hours because his uh, parents wouldn't let him drive uh, at night. <laughs> that's a great story. That's yeah. awesome. What so a great piece of history. We, we go to Hempstead. Uh, my first time in that particular movie theater. And the audience is very uh, vivacious and they're yelling and screaming at everything. And I've never seen an audience quite like that. <laughs> and, uh, That's funny. Well, yeah, he, I, I'm from not too far. I'm from South Hempstead, so I'm right, so right over there. Seven minutes left in the movie and the screen goes out. Oh. Now, now the screen is being bombarded with sodas and people are yelling, screaming. And Eddie, an unknown, total unknown. I mean, they knew him on... You know, no one knows he's there. Goes up to the front and goes, hey, what are you all yelling at? This is my damn movie. And I want to see the end. Hey, Mr. Cameraman. Mr. Cameraman. Get that film. I want that film back up there. Well, the place went absolutely crazy. He calmed them down. He did stand-up comedy for an audience of 400, 500 wow. people. And then all of a sudden, oh, we are ready to continue the movie. The place went ballistic crazy. I must have taken us an hour and a half to get out of there. They were climbing all over him, writing. There was no, there was no very few cameras there. Nobody had a camera phone. Right. Uh, oh. He signed autographs, and I was like, "This is amazing." It yeah. sounds like a movie in and of itself. It sounds like it would make a great movie. Yeah. Two years later, I mean, he, he's he's like you know off the charts big. I go to see his show. He has the Bus Boys uh, opening for him, and uh, we're in his bus, and there's cops outside. I go, "What's with all these cops?" I thought there was like a crime in the area. He goes, security. He goes, I go, what? He goes, you don't understand, Richie. It's been a crazy two, three years. I go, what are you talking about? He said, uh, I can't go out there. I said, oh, why not? He said, I'm like Elvis Presley. I went, oh, God, Eddie, really? Are you losing that bad? You think you're Elvis Presley? He, he is. He hey, man, I don't think I'm Elvis Presley. They think I'm Elvis Presley. I go, oh. The people out there think you're Elvis Presley. Large crowd, but there was like 20 cops, so there, nothing outrageous. He goes, you want to see what it's like? I said, all right. He opens the door. We go outside. They go crazy. They put, knock down the barricade. They're being, they're, I got scratched across the face. Eddie's clothes are gone. Hey, and they ripped off his shirt and sweater. He wow. comes back. The he showed you. The, bus, the cops get us back on the bus. They go, he said, hey, King. They scuffed your blue suede shoes. Right. <laughs> oh, that's he goes, great. It's insane. I go, that happens after every show? That happens at the grocery store. I go, oh, you got to be kidding me. And, and it, it did. He did sure. it early, around the clock. Yeah. I really love that. That's a great, great anecdote. People are going to love to hear that. Yeah. Uh, Richie, as always, we run out of time for these things. And it was really nice to, oh my God, he's gone again. Who did that? I need a more professional setup over here. <laughs> I'm so happy to have Jackie, you. Paul. Jackie has a very professional setup. <laughs> yeah, he has like a fake background. There's a fake like uh, books desk and everything. It's, oh, it's I, love really... the, I love the brick wall and I really do love the May, I, May West. I, I don't know. I thought she was the coolest lady in the world. I just read a, a, a book about her. She was way ahead of her time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's amazing that someone like her was even able to be that successful after the Hayes Act. Yeah, she was. She was uh, doing uh, strip clubs. And uh, in fact, she used to go out with the Jack Johnson, the black heavyweight champion of the world, way ahead of her time. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really she interesting. And then well, W.C. Fields took a liking to her and kind of brought her into mainstream. She was a, 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 you know, today if they want to be a star, they want a 20 year old Miley Cyrus. And then had, she made it after she was, she was like Rodney Dangerfield. After she was 50 years old is when she got big. May, May and West and W.C. <laughs> they, they did a movie together, W.C. Fields and May West. They did something together. I remember. They did a bunch of movies together. They did a bunch of movies together. This, let me tell you how long, her last movie was with Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's really? how long she lasted. Wow. That's right. I think I saw got the them. same little, hey, Arnold, you know, and playing the same movie. She must have been 80-some-odd years old. 
Right. It might have been some. Was it in a movie or was it like off of one of those like Jack Benny hours or something like that? Might have been. I think it was a movie, but okay. you know what? We're gonna we're gonna Google it. We're gonna Google it. Time. Yeah. Good. You're gonna Google it, Millie. Yeah. Go we'll wait. Movie with Mae West and. I am gonna I'm gonna outro this now. Okay. This, uh, this was a great great interview. I was really honored to have you and to chat with you, and you're a great guy, and I look hey, forward to chatting great. again. And I um, love your look. I love the pompadour. I love the pompadour. That's a beauty. I was trying to get it a little higher, but the Spaniard, <laughs> the Spaniard who cut my hair this last week is being assassinated. So, <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to. But anyway, um, okay. we had a really good time. Oh, Millie, did you find it? Did you Google it? Did no, you get you it? Terminator Dark Fate or Game Changers or... Uh, all right. Well, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, we're gonna find out. I'll see you next time. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. Thanks for checking out. Welcome back it's to America. Millie, Welcome goodbye. Back. Love you. So good to see you. Love okay. You all. Ciao.